welcome to, to all of you and thank you for coming to this morning's panel on community-based planning, the future of development in New York City. My name is David Scobie. I'm the executive dean of the New School for Public Engagement here at the New School, uh, the division that is proud to sponsor this event. Uh, the New School, as many of you I'm sure know, has long been committed to scholarship teaching and learning that deeply engages the most important public issues in our community. We are especially engaged with New York uh, and have been so since our founding in 1919. New York's not just our home but our partner uh, in our work and we consider ourselves civic partners in the public work of New York. And the New School's also been long a place committed to serving as a public forum for discussion of the most important issues concerning our community. And on all three of those fronts and with those values, we're delighted to be sponsoring this. Nothing better exemplifies uh, the New School's traditions and values than our division, the New School for Public Engagement, which is committed to, a, to learning and action, to the integration of theory and practice in a range of programs that take on important social issues and public cultural issues uh, from urban policy to international affairs to media studies. Uh, and those values uh, are uh, exemplified by the Milano School for International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy, one of the five schools in our division. Milano's mission uh, is to f educate students and foster research and policy and advocacy work on the most important issues of international affairs, policy, nonprofit management, with a special commitment to urban issues and to our New York City home. And the Center for New York City Affairs plays an especially important role in those commitments and it has an especially important place in the Milano School and our division. The center's mission is to work on a wide range of research and advocacy and educational projects concerning neighborhood, community, family issues, issues that especially that affect family and children across the New York City scene. But one of its most important and vibrant functions is to serve as a convener for public programs on issues of deep import for policy and politics and community life in New York. Today's forum on community-based planning is in the very best traditions of the center, of the Milano School, of our division, and of the new school. I, I thought of my introduction today as a set of Chinese dolls of all the great things that surround this, uh, this uh, panel on community-based uh, planning. Uh, for making today's event possible, I'd like to thank a number of people, first of all, Edison Properties and our friend Steve Nislik, a member of the division's Board of Governors. Uh, the Milano Foundation and the Cirrus Fund are grateful, uh, we are grateful to all of them for making possible uh, this public program uh, and others. Uh, and now to, to introduce the panel uh, and launch the program, I wanna uh, invite my colleague and friend Andrew White, the director of the Center for New York City Affairs to come up. Good morning. I'm glad you could all make it. Um, the Center for New York City Affairs is a applied policy research institute. We work, as David said, on child and family issues and public education. Um, we do events on a whole slew of different issues and um, they reflect our interest in how government policy affects neighborhoods in New York City and beyond. This actually is gonna be one in a series that we hope to do over the course of this year about the future of development in New York, given that you know, we're still coming out, I hope we're coming out of uh, pretty horrible economic times. It's hard to know if we're coming out of it or not. But eventually, development is gonna come back, roar back into New York. The question is, what shape will it take? And this is a chance to start talking about that. I want to, um, I want to thank Alana Moyer for helping organize this and doing a lot of the hard brain work to make it happen. She's a student in the Milano School. I also want to thank Anna Schneider, Jackie Wayans, and the other students who have put this together. Um, Community-based planning, um, you know, you, there have been forums on this 
since long before my time in uh, looking at public policy, and you can go back at least to the 40s and 50s and the uh, fights with Robert Moses and probably further beyond that to see the long legacy of efforts to integrate community people um, or for long efforts of community people to insert themselves into planning. Um, back in the mid-90s, uh, Richard Kahan and Harry D. Rienzo were working on a uh, series of forums up in the Bronx around the city's efforts to, to reorient planning, to come up with rezoning in a handful of neighborhoods up there. They had the foresight and intelligence to seed the stage to a group of community activists during a presentation about the Melrose plan. And that action, where they gave up the stage, they led, it led to an incredibly productive series of meetings and planning efforts that resulted in a plan actually being created and followed by HPD and by the city. It's one of these rare examples where community residents indeed shaped the future of their neighborhood in New York. I was struck when I read Jarrett Murphy's remarkable, if you haven't seen this, you should pick it up. It's a, it came out about a year ago now, or eight months ago, really a sort of overview of where things stand in terms of urban planning in New York. Um, I was struck that uh, you know, that Melrose plan remains one of the best, if not the best example of community involvement in planning. And that was you know, 14, 15 years ago now. So what does that say about where we've come? Obviously, other things have happened since. One of the things that's arisen in years since, and one of the reasons we convened this event, community benefits agreements have come onto the scene in New York. Um, the reality is more often when local people in large numbers get involved in efforts to plan, it's more uh, exercise in delay um, and gumming up the works than in moving things forward. So we wanted to talk about community benefits agreements, community boards, where do they meet, um, how do they connect, and what is the, f is there potential future to give community boards more teeth? Is that something that we want? Um, who benefits, who loses. Today is a chance to discuss all of that, and we, um, our featured speaker this morning is Borough President Scott Stringer. I was intrigued to see his proposals for reforming the planning process and giving, giving more teeth to the community boards and changing the way the City Planning Commission deals with them. So, it's fitting that he's here to talk about it. The way this is going to work this morning is the borough president will will speak for a few minutes. Then he'll come up to the, he'll sit at the table. Jarrett Murphy from City Limits, editor in chief of City Limits, will come up here and do a quick Q and A with the borough president. Invite the rest of the panel up, and then with about a half hour left in the session, we'll have room for questions. We'll have a couple of staff people with microphones going around and uh, you'll just have to put up your hands and wait for the microphone to come to you. So um, I'm happy to uh, bring to the podium Manhattan Borough President Pro uh, Scott Stringer. He is a former state assemblyman who represented the Upper West Side for 13 years. He's been per Borough President for many years now and truly his primary or, or strongest um, role in city government, strongest official role, is right here in the sweet spot of community-based planning. Borough President. Well, uh, thank you so much for that nice introduction, and it's great to see everybody uh, here this morning to talk about one of the great, exciting, sexy issues of our time, comprehensive urban planning and community boards. You were, you were all in the league by yourselves. <laughs> Everybody out there today is going to work, but no, all of you wanted to come and talk about this great issue, so I'm very excited. And that's why uh, I, I just want to thank uh, David Scobie and Andrew White and Jarrett Murphy and all of you for coming here today. I also want to thank Steve Nislick, the CEO of Edison Properties, who I know cares very much about this topic, and the former director of our Department of Planning in our office, Anthony Borelli, who I think working collaboratively with me over the years was able to put in place some uh, amazing ways to engage communities in the planning process. And this is an issue near and dear to me, and in many ways this has become a defining issue 
for me as borough president because community-based planning is so much broader than simple advocacy. It's economic planning, it's the social and environmental health of our communities, and it does have an impact on our children's education. And that is why as we contemplate further development projects across New York, I do firmly believe that we have to engage neighborhoods, builders, uh, city planning, uh, the city planning department. We have to build a coalition of stakeholders to get a desired result for the community and the economic well-being of the city. And part of what I tried to do when I became borough president is figure out how we could change the great skyline of Manhattan and the city, but do it in a way that incorporated basic community relationships so that whatever kind of planning would eventually be part of a neighborhood, development projects could coexist with neighborhoods. So when I became borough president, we looked at our different areas of, of charter mandated responsibility, and I found that there was one urban planner in our whole office, some 60 employees and one urban planner. So the first thing we had to do was revamp our planning department. And we actually hired a land use director and a deputy. We hired community-based urban planners and matched them with community boards so that every community board had an urban planner. We then went out and devised a very successful urban planning graduate fellowship program where we took young graduate students, gave them a stipend, and then they became part of the community process. They didn't work in the borough president's office hanging out. They actually went into East Harlem, West Side, Uptown, Downtown, and worked like the Peace Corps. These young people started to work on development issues with our neighborhood folks. In fact, when I became borough president, the first thing we did with the community boards is became, we established a community-based merit selection process. So here we created a land use department, an urban fellow graduate program, but we actually set up an independent screening panel to vet community board applicants so that we could tear down the barriers between people who wanted to participate in the communities, but if they didn't support the right candidate, they probably weren't gonna serve on the community board. Our merit-based selection process engaged neighborhood organizations, the NAACP, the Hispanic Federation, uh, Citizens Union, all the good government groups, created an interview process for people who wanted to belong to community boards and went to a merit-based system. So by depoliticizing the process, we started to get more stakeholders who actually felt they could participate with community boards. We reached out to make the boards more diverse, so we made sure that we had people of different backgrounds come into this process. So we actually put appointed LGBT community board members, not just in the village board, but throughout the city. We put more African-American and Latino members on community boards on the east side and other places where traditionally those appointees could not gain entrance to a community board. And we put the first Caucasian members on the boards in central Harlem. Diversity was the strength because part of what a community board has to be is reflective of our neighborhoods. So we went to a merit-based system. And the first time I went through this, there was one caveat that I had when I first got elected. We're in the middle of the selection process, and I said to our deputy borough president, you know, there's this one guy who, when my mother was running for city council, put out this terrible campaign literature, and he's on this committee board in CB12, and when I was running for borough president, I used to fantasize about throwing him off the committee board <laughs> because he was putting out the, all this bad literature against me 28 years later. So I had this real fantasy. And I would, I would stand in 95 degree weather and I couldn't wait to get my hands on him. So during this reform process, I said, let's check out his attendance record and see if we can get him out. And our deputy board president came to me and said, you're not talking about that guy. He's been on the board for 20 years. He's never missed a community board meeting. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, but remember, it's all about the committee meeting. So go back and check his attendance record. Scott, he's never missed a local committee meeting. I said, wait a minute, that's impossible. Check his evaluations that we're doing. Oh, they thought he was the greatest appointee ever. I went, oh my God, I reappointed him. My mother never talked to me again. <laughs> People were stunned. But by doing that, it signaled the end of an era of political give and take and payback. 
and it gave me important credibility in the political community to say that we're going to have this merit-based system. Today, our boards are more diverse, are more um, reflective of neighborhoods, and by giving them more training and resources, we've created the ability for local activists to stand with big developers, $700 an hour lawyers, planners, and the community. And the result has been pretty extraordinary. When we combined all of our tools, we started to look at zoning and building out this interaction. On the rezoning on the west side in the west 90s and 100s, we created a zoning process that worked. We did this in many other areas around Manhattan, and then the big day came for us. Columbia University wanted to expand, and all of our energy went into trying to create a zoning that worked for the community, but also recognizing that Columbia University had to expand its campus in order to remain competitive with the rest of the world. And also, this was an important centerpiece of job creation, making sure that research and development could happen in the city, that we would create the opportunity to expand universities so that we can continue to grab the best and the brightest all over the world. But Columbia left to their own devices, would simply overrun the community and would not coexist with the neighborhood. We were able to create a balanced expansion plan and working with Amanda Burden today, we are now creating a historic rezoning of that community that achieves the right balance. We then went to work on Fordham University expansion and we learned a couple of things. Unlike at the Columbia University uh, land use process where the community board said no to the project but made very important recommendations through a 197A plan and through their ULIP application process, they gave the elected officials a roadmap for what we needed to achieve. In the Fordham process, the community board was obviously against the Fordham expansion, but when they voted no, they didn't give us a roadmap for what we needed to achieve in order to get it right. And I realized then that community boards, as much as we want community-based planning, we have to make sure that the community board members do not become political, meaning they're afraid to get their hands dirty and give us a roadmap. And I have a lot of great respect for my community board on seven, but I think it was a very serious mistake. So learning from the two experiences, we then working closely on the NYU development, which is obviously very controversial and it's now coming up as we speak, we have to figure out the responsible role of communities and community boards and deal with and tackle the whole notion of this huge NYU expansion. So these are some of the issues I want to throw out to you because sometimes it's not black and white, there were a lot of shades of gray, and while I could certainly criticize big developers and I could criticize this, you know, the mayor's office if I choose to, we also have to make sure that community folks step up in this planning process as well. And a couple of things I just want to just touch on for you, what's the future of community-based planning, what do we do now? Well, the truth of the matter is, one, we have to recognize that community boards have to change. In the 1970s, the community board process shifted. When Wagner instituted community planning councils, they were really supposed to be planning vehicles in the, 19, in the 1950s. In the 1975 charter revision process, community boards changed their name from community planning boards to community boards and became service delivery agents. They set up an office, a district manager, and the job of the community board was less about planning, more about filling potholes. But shortly thereafter, in the late 70s, process change when local elected officials started to have professional staff, local district offices, suddenly in a community board district, you had a whole lot of uh, social workers and young people who were doing constituent work, and the community board sort of took a back seat in that process. Today, after 311 and these professional staffs, I think community boards have to become community planning boards for neighborhoods, rather than have uh, young graduate students acting as planners. We need to hire planners for every community board and mandate that in, in the city, in the next city charter revision commission. And that's the proposal I put out and I'd be happy to talk to all of you again. Planning is vital to the city. And I commend Amanda Bird and the city planning commission for the rezonings around the city that I think it has now included 10,000 square blocks in the city 
that is historic in and of itself. But we have to figure out how we actually plan long term for the city beyond community boards and local neighborhoods. So right now, the City Planning Commission is a planning vehicle when developers of the city comes up with a big mega project. And they do an excellent job interacting with the community. But we have to get into the long range planning process like Seattle and California and London, where we start to look at planning in the long term that includes multiple agencies and stakeholders. So you can't plan for a large campus expansion without involving the Department of Transportation and other agencies in the city that have to look at what the impact will be on those on that big development. That's something we have to figure out beyond the City Planning Commission, what agency or what entity will help us plan long term. I think all of us should think about that. And second, or lastly, when you look at planning, it's not just about big buildings and luxury and low-income housing, but it can impact schools and children. When we started in our office, we understood that parents were coming to me saying, my neighborhood schools are overcrowded. And we went to the Department of Education and said, why is there such overcrowding in our school districts? And the Department of Education said, school districts aren't overcrowded, Mr. Borough President. Look at the numbers. And they were right. When you look at a local school district, which could be 100 blocks long, the district was not overcrowded. But when you break down the neighborhoods, you found large overcrowding on the Upper East Side and Lower Manhattan. We needed to figure out how to build more schools. And that's when our office issued a groundbreaking report, thanks to Brian Cook and others that talked about school overcrowding from the perspective of land use and zoning. In other words, we took the number of building permits issued. We looked at the City Department of Planning numbers on anticipated children in local communities. And what we found is the inadequate, inadequate ability to create school seats, even though we were building so many new buildings that were going to have thousands of children in Manhattan. We created a new protocol for how we deal with school construction. We worked a private partnership with developers who sought to build their huge buildings, but also they had an obligation to help us build new schools. And we've been able to build schools in a public-private partnership with some of the great real estate families in Manhattan because they recognize that it's good business to have school seats next to, the, uh, next to their big development, and we need that from a public perspective in the city. Again, school construction should no longer be about, well, we have a capital plan, we'll build some schools from the School Construction Authority. We said, don't do it that way come in and let's analyze the kind of school seats we need in local neighborhoods. And I was very proud when the new chancellor, Dennis Walcott, spoke to how DOE now looks at school construction and how he talked about how DOE is now working with local communities and they now look at local neighborhoods. And I smiled because that was the basis for our report many years ago. And I was very proud that they actually adopted uh, our policy and our work product. So in short, when you're looking at schools or communities or skylines changing or the health of neighborhoods relating to environmental justice, there, does, there is a relationship between community, big developers, and city agencies. The question for all of us is what is the next iteration of community-based planning? And my view, very simply, is it's not just about community-based planning versus city planning or big development planning. Actually, community-based planning should be part of the regular planning process where there is give and take, where there's rational policy debate. I don't think communities should simply say no to every building over 10 stories, and I don't think developers should be able to say it's my way or the highway. How we create that mix will be dependent on whether we can give communities the tools they need to become part of a rational process. I think that's something that we have to think about. And finally, what I would say to all of the people who are young and in school today, going out and becoming an urban planner, I think is going to be the next important job in this city. In the post-Bloomberg era, when we have to become more collaborative with communities beyond Manhattan, when we look at how we're going to transform boroughs like the Bronx and places that have traditionally been ignored when it relates to planning, 
we need to engage the next generation of planners, planners who come from different communities, planners who look at their own communities where they were born and raised and say, we want to help change the skyline of our neighborhood, but we want to make sure that we protect the health of our communities, that our grandparents can stay in the neighborhoods that they created, and that we want to keep the best and the brightest here in the city, the ones who will go to NYU and Columbia and the City University of New York and the New School. We want to use the powers of zoning and planning to keep the vibrancy and the diversity of the city and the smart intellectual capital that we develop through this planning process. That is how we're going to shape this city, both from a land use perspective and from a human capital perspective. And that's the kind of work we've been trying to do in our office. We need all of you in this room to start figuring out when we do have a Charter Revision Commission that doesn't just talk about third terms and fourth terms for mayors and other such elected officials, but rather has an understanding that we have to look at our city government that was put in place in the 1989 charter, and we really haven't taken a look at how we use government to plan better for this city. So it's going to be a very exciting time in the next 10 years, and I want very much to start this conversation. I thank you for allowing me to be here. I hope we laid out some of these issues. I'd be happy to take any questions. If Jarrett is drilling down on me too hard, I beg you to step up and interrupt and ask questions, because he, he's a tough guy. So thank you all very much, and it's great to be here. I'd be happy to talk to him. So uh, City Limits is now in its 35th year, I believe. Hard to believe, but it's uh, still the most vital um, source, both on the web and in the quarterly magazine, on issues around New York's neighborhoods, community building, and all of the various forms of community building. I'm very pleased to have Jarrett Murphy here. He's the editor of Chief of City Limits. He's going to um, do his Q&A and then bring up the panel. So Jarrett. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks again for coming, and thanks to Andrew for the kind words about the magazine. Um, there are actually copies of the planning issue outside, and if everyone in this room took one, that would, I think, double the readership that that <laughs> issue attracted. It, we, we thought that an issue uh, about community planning would fly off the shelves. We thought by putting a dead fish on the cover, um, we would really seal the deal, but for some reason, it, it just didn't take off. So this is your chance to get them at a price that can't be beat. Um, Vote President Stringer, I was thinking the last time that I heard you speak pub publicly about community-based planning was before the Charter Revision Commission, um, uh, during the, the heady days when we thought it was going to talk about more than, than term limits. At that point, you laid out a series of recommendations for how to change the process. Um, you, you spoke about your experience in terms of improving community boards, but you talked also about the, the, the role that the boards and the borough president play in the process the voting rules and I think even the composition of the planning commission in terms of where the appointments come from. Do you still think that those moves are necessary? Can you talk a little bit about them and why we, we need them or, or don't anymore? Well, part of what I think a charter vision would accomplish was simply to look at the planning process in the city and figure out is are there ways to improve it. So what we tried to do during this char the charter vision commission that never really took off we analyze different aspects of how we can make things better. So I touched on the fact that community board reform in Manhattan, where we went to a merit-based system and gave the boards resources like urban planning graduate students, could we codify that in a charter revision process? So we offered proposals to take this idea citywide. And we debated this with the city planning commission staff members and the executive director, Lorna Goodman, who, by the way, I thought was just a brilliant pick for this particular role. And we worked closely with her to see if we could accomplish that. Obviously, we didn't gain the traction that we wanted. So we wanted to codify some of what we were doing in Manhattan. But we also wanted to look at what a planning process could be like in the long term. Not to denigrate or take away the role of the City Planning Commission whose membership and whose staff work is extraordinary, but could we put together some kind of planning agency modeled after other cities and, st and states and countries and model this planning process 
to do long range thinking that would involve multiple city agencies. So if you're going to change the skyline, say in the Bronx, you can't really look at large scale development with bringing the DOT to the table, the Department of Education to the table, the Department of Environmental Conservation at the table. We need to have people thinking long range about this. So if you're going to create 10,000 units of affordable housing, someone probably should have a conversation with the Department of Education about how we're going to get those school seats and what is the private-public partnership to fund that. If you look at the planning process today, the charter requires, I think, 33 separate performance and accountability documents. That's in the charter today. Now, we don't actually go through and, and read all those 33 um, performance and accountability proposals, but we should because the process in a lot of ways have become cumbersome and the priorities have shifted to more bureaucracy than reality. So I would hope that we would have a Charter Vision Commission process that could become excite an exciting vehicle to change the way we look at some of these issues. Do you think ULERP as it stands now needs to be tweaked? Uh, I think earlier you spoke and others have spoken about um, changing the, the weight that is given to recommendations by the boards and by the borough presidents in terms of when they go to the, the CPC. Do you think that still needs attention? I think that it's, it's a worthy discussion. I'm not here to advocate for community boards actually having the ability to turn down projects. And I'm not here to only advocate for community-based planning as a way for people to say, oh, I don't like that in my neighborhood. The community boards as they stand now are advisory, and I'm fine with that. What I have difficulty with is the lack of funding for these boards, the lack of training of these boards, the fact that they have, they have to go back to their original mission, which is planning, and therefore we need to give them resources to advise developers and, devi and advise the city on how we can shape the planning process. That has to be the priority. We get caught up as to what advisory role people have, and I will be bold. Everybody knows that I think the borough presidents play an important role in this process, and obviously my office has made a real difference on a lot of these projects, but I don't want you to give me more power, right? I'm fine with Councilman Robert Jackson having the important role the city council plays at the end of, the de of this development process. I think we've seen a very good result. So I have no problem giving Council Member Jackson more authority than my office has, but I need you to give me resources so I can partner with Robert Jackson, and because my constituency is larger, I can look at a development project not just from the local impact, but from the perspective of the whole borough. And I think advisory roles are important if you're willing to fund them and nurture them and give us resources. And I think that's the difference. And hello, Councilman. Bob Jackson, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, an earlier um, attempt at charter revision uh, in 1989 held out, I think, the prospect of some of the long-term comprehensive planning that, that we're talking about today through the 197A process. And something that you and I have discussed before is, you know, how in, the 197A is our attempt by community boards to, instead of being reactive, to look ahead of time at what they want their area to look like in 10 or 20 years. Um, but the question is, you know, what role those documents should play uh, in the planning process? What kind of weight should attend to them? Uh, do you think that the 197A process as it works now um, is viable? Do you think that we need to change how the planning commission and the department uh, use 197A plans and what kind of attention they pay to them? Uh, what do you think about that? I, I think 197A in many, many situations is the point in the process where communities work so hard f in their role to create comprehensive planning, but way too often the 197A is a manual that gathers dust on the shelf. It's just a reality. And I think that the process is presently constituted basically sends communities on a false, tr on, on, you know, on a false mission. The notion that we're going to create a document that's going to get incorporated in the planning process, too many of these plans get dusted off only at the last minute and maybe a little piecemeal comes out of it. That's why we want to look at long-range planning that involves community 
and agencies so that we can create 197 type local planning for something that really matters. So imagine the community board having a professional urban planner. Imagine a community that could interact on a three to five year plan with an agency in city government that speaks to different agency involvement and then in partnership with the city planning commission, the mayor's office, coming up with a document that everybody can buy into. So it's not just the community versus the developer or the community versus the city agency, but everybody's at the table looking at mitigation, looking at ways to, if we, need build, if we need to build schools, if we need to deal with environmental justice issues, and create a process that is less con confrontational, but more about a planning process that works. And I will tell you, this is not a pipe dream. This is something we must do in this city because we are lagging behind other cities, other cities around the world who understand that as we look at different issues, it's going to be about what city that can drill down on, 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 on responsible development that will continue to attract people from all over the world. And because New York City is a magnet for people who want to live here, people who want to work here, people who want to get educated here, we're going to have to figure out how we create communities where the entrance fee is not a $2 million co-op. At the same time, we need to look at our areas to create places for artists, for actors, for people who want to become part of the panache of the city. And we do have a special obligation, and this came out in the Columbia rezoning, that I could not support a plan for university expansion, as important that expansion was for the entire city, without protecting the people of West Harlem through a rezoning process, the people who came to West Harlem 20, 30, 40 years ago, who built up the neighborhood, the schools, the daycare centers, created affordable housing. These were the pioneers who went through the crack epidemic, the crisis in education. These were folks who were the pioneers in communities. And we were not gonna let people get thrown out of their neighborhoods, even though we knew we had to expand Columbia. And that's why the Columbia model that Bob and I worked on and others has to be studied because it was a way of creating expansion and at the same time working with Amanda Burden, creating the opportunity to rezone our neighborhoods. Well, I think with that, we should probably bring up uh, the members of our uh, community for the day, uh, our panelists. Um, if you take the stage. And I'm going to be joined now by Richard uh, Eady, who's uh, vice chair of the City Planning Commission, uh, David Shuffler, who is the executive director of uh, Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice in the Bronx, Julia Vitula Martin, uh, longtime housing and development expert now with the Regional Plan Association, and Paul Graziano, who is a uh, community planner. Uh, their full and much more impressive bios are in, your, uh, in the handouts. Um, but I won't delay with that because I want to go to the first question, which is um, to David. We're talking about communities and planning and, and how communities feel they're treated in the process. You work very much on the grassroots level. What's your experience been with, uh, with planning and how community voices are treated? Sure, sure. Great. Good morning, everyone. I'd I like to thank the New School for this uh, panel and, and this actual forum. I think it's a, a great discussion thus far. Um, so Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice was founded 17 years ago. We're located in the South Bronx in the Bronx River neighborhood, uh, community board number um, uh, uh, community district number nine, uh, council member Annabelle Palmer. Um, and what the way youth ministry started was uh, we first started doing our work around youth development, right? Uh, we, we were developed and created in response to uh, the fact that in our neighborhood we were the only community-based organization. Um, in our first years in 94 and 95, as young people started coming into the organization, and I was a young person at that time in the process, um, we, our, our main concern was literacy development, right? Um, and as we began to dig in deeper to the ailments around literacy development, what we determined was that there were a whole host of other social justice issues that needed to be looked at. Access to park space, quality of housing, asthma rates in our community. Um, that led us to really determine and work on looking at our community as a neighborhood and a vessel to create um, 
uh, better learning environments for our young people. Uh, that led us to developing two parks. Um, we were in the uh, district uh, that has the lowest per, um, ratio between um, people and park space in the entire country. Um, some of the highest asthma rates in the entire country. Um, so I, I'm glad to say we've, uh, in the South Bronx now, has have developed over 30 some odd acres of waterfront park space. Um, if you look at how the development has happened, um, you're, you're talking about um, in, in a city that's so dense, the limited opportunities that we have to do development um, has pushed us to look at uh, contaminated sites, um, it has pushed us to look at uh, different opportunities and development in a different way. Um, so the way we've been really engaged in um, planning processes have been through a lot of visioning, um, looking at things that were coming down the pipe, um, and sometimes even having to be reactive when speculators and other things had come into our neighborhood. So um, we've been really involved in, in planning in, in that way, and um, I have a lot more to talk about, especially around ULERP and 197A, so well, I'll leave it there. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> Paul, I think you and I met several years ago when you were uh, attempting to landmark, I think, 1,300 uh, parcels, uh, single-family homes mainly in Flushing. Uh, Queens. So your experience has been, I think, with a lot of projects that uh, run a bit broader in terms of the land involved and the community voices you've had to incorporate. Talk to me about not only how you've done in terms of dealing with city planning and the commission, but how you have worked uh, with council members and others to yourself incorporate community voices. That's a, that's a tall order. Um, Let's just put it this way. I think that, um, uh, and, and uh, by the way, thank you, uh, Borough President, for speaking so eloquently. Uh, some of your you. uh, ideas are fantastic. Um, I've, I've been at this now for 18 years. I uh, started when I was 22 years old because my neighborhood was being, uh, and, and continues to be to this day, as many neighborhoods outside of, well, and within Manhattan as well, have been um, really uh, um, threatened by overdevelopment issues. And it doesn't matter whether they are um, uh, low income, middle income, upper income, everybody, the, the common thread up until very recently, I would say until the economic downturn, particularly in the last 10 years, has been uh, a perceived threat to a way of life. And when the community does get involved, uh, a lot of the times you can have some positive effects on what happens in the future. What I can say is that <clears throat> depending on the situation, um, it can either work or it can be completely ignored. And um, I, I think the, the landmarking issue, which has not been brought up at all until you brought it up, um, is, is a critical component to planning. And actually, outside of New York City, uh, most landmarking or historic preservation issues are incorporated into planning issues. Now, <clears throat> when the Landmarks Commission was created, it was created specifically to be a separate agency. And while there might be a positive ramification to splitting it off from the, the, the City Planning Commission, in some cases, in other cases, I think it has removed it and isolated it and created a situation where, because they have sole discretion and sole determination of what comprises an important building or important neighborhoods uh, has really left a lot of places uh, in, in, in disarray or, or lacking in the importance that, that they deserve to be designated. So just very quickly, because uh, you know, this is a, a, a long panel and a lot of questions, the, the issue that Jared is discussing is um, <clears throat> was in the Village Voice when he was a, a reporter for there uh, back in 2004, 2005, something like that, <clears throat> where my neighborhood, uh, I, I placed 1,300 buildings on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's a planned community that's 100 years old and very suburban in nature, uh, great architecture, et cetera. Uh, the problem is that the Landmarks Commission does not like to designate, in general, suburban neighborhoods. Uh, there are 110 historic districts approximately in the city of New York. 90% uh, of them you could consider urban, 
when you think that New York City, actually 50% of the land in New York City is suburban in nature, uh, whether it's Queens or Southern Brooklyn or Staten Island or parts of the Bronx, et cetera. So when you have an agency that isn't looking at the full picture and not looking at the full scope of the city, and you have deserving neighborhoods that want designation, we're not even talking about the places that are incredibly important that deserve designation, but areas that deserve it and want it. And the commission will not do it even after it's received designation at the national and state level, as well as support from every elected official, except for the mayor, we have a problem. So. Let me just jump in with a couple of yeah. housekeeping notes. First, I should have mentioned that, you know, unlike community boards, panel members, it's okay if you just want to say no. Uh, if anybody on the panel says something you disagree with, please feel free to jump in or agree with. Um, and secondly, the borough president may have to leave before the conclusion of the panel, but his able backup is, is fully stretched out and warmed up and we'll jump in for him. I want so, to listen to them though, I don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to bring in um, Richard Eady because we've heard from people who work on kind of the community side of the fence, you know, you're the guy who's at the end of this Euler process, um, hearing the voices of the community and the borough president and others. How does the planning commission approach those voices and those comments and, and in your experience, when has it said yes or no to them and, and how have, has that been handled? Yeah. So, as well, I want to say thank you for having and hosting this uh, important forum. Um, I actually approached this from a very, a somewhat unique perspective. I actually have served on the community board in the past. I also have served as a deputy borough president as well. So I've seen this process from many different angles. Um, the planning process in New York City is a very complicated one, as we all know, and it, projects do come before the Commission, but oftentimes there is a lot of dialogue and communication long before the project actually comes to the Commission. Even during pre-certification, um, there's often involvement of the community. Um, the city, as um, Borough President Stringer mentioned, has done 113 rezonings. Um, Chair Burden goes out to each of the communities, meets with the community boards, meets with civic organizations. Um, staff sometimes has tens if not hundreds of meetings and these processes can last years before the project comes before the commission for certification. So by the time that um, a rezoning comes or even sometimes private applications comes before the commission, there has been a lot of dialogue with the local community, with the community board. And then through the city planning process, there's additional public hearings by the community board, by the borough president. And so there's a lot of opportunity for this dialogue to occur. And then there's also the, um, the public hearing the commission holds itself. And so when we look at a rezoning or a private application, we take all of this into account. All these voices are important. Uh, the community board, a lot of rezonings have been modified and changed based upon testimony at the City Planning Commission. And, you know, I agree that all these voices are important and should be at the table, and I would offer that. I think they are. Um, the process is one that is very inclusive, and, you know, everyone doesn't always get what they want, but I think no one can say they weren't heard. Uh, Julia, you know, we talk about community and we talk about community boards and they're not necessarily the same thing. One of the questions when dealing with community planning is how do you identify the community and how do you incorporate their voices? What do you think about community boards as a, as a mechanism for doing what they're supposed to do in this process of, you know, funneling the opinions and the desires of a community uh, into, into ULERP and into the City Planning Commission? Do you think they're up to that task? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'd like to um, begin by noting that um, uh, the borough president uh, made what may be the most important point about the difficulty that he faces um, with community boards, and that is that he has to bring forward always the perspective and the public interest of the entire borough, and the community board is representing its neighborhood. Um, so that's the first thing, that we have to keep in mind the 
interest of the borough and indeed the interest of the entire city and the interest of the city and the borough and the neighbor the interests of the city the neighbor and the borough are, uh, are, are just not always the same and that's the problem um, I happen to be a great fan of um, the fair share provision from the 1989 charter that actually was never fully implemented in New York. And I think if it were taken very seriously, that that, along with some of the suggestions that Scott is making for community boards, um, for example, the proposal for uh, boards having resources and professional planners, could be immensely useful. And I'm sure most people in the room know what fair share is, but just in case, um, the fair share provision of the 1989 charter required the city um, to draw up um, an atlas of city-owned properties and to let community boards know um, of any proposed changes with city-owned facilities in their neighborhoods. That is, um, any facilities that uh, might have um, might have positive impact, but might have negative impact. I mean, fair share was a way of trying to make sure that certain neighborhoods would not be, as they have been, overburdened with what are clearly difficult facilities like waste treatment plants and um, certain kinds of uh, environmental facilities and drug treatment centers, um, all of which however important they are to the city and to um, the welfare of the city, can have difficult impacts on a neighborhood. So with sort of those points, um, I would say that uh, the community boards um, are an absolutely vital uh, part of New York City's um, zeitgeist and I simply can't imagine how the city would go forward without them and we are so much better off than we were than uh, we were say 40 years ago because we have strong energetic fully engaged uh, community boards. Uh, Borough President, I think Julia brings up an important tension uh, in the process which is between the desires of the community board and the fact that we do have citywide needs and you alluded to that in your remarks. You know, one of the, I think, issue areas where that comes up is industry in the city. Um, the desire to have blue collar jobs. Um, obviously, to have that, you have to have blue collar factories, but people don't typically line up to want to live next to them. Um, how do you handle a fair share process, which I think most people agree would, is a good idea? Um, how do you reconcile that with the idea to have these sort of larger um, economic goals for the city like retaining and expanding industry. I mean, that was, uh, I think, an issue at, in the Columbia area of Manhattanville, that there was some light industry there. Um, how did it play out there, and how do you think it should play out citywide? Well, I, 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 I think Julia brought home the, the reality of changing the skyline in the city, which is there's going to be natural tension between the view of the local community and the much larger view of a borough or of a city. So how we incorporate that into a process where we get a, de a desired result is the key to this discussion. So obviously, w when you look at long-range planning beyond the day-to-day -day ULERP application, and you go to certain communities, you have to say a number of things. Let's look at El Barrio in East Harlem. This is a community where, for 40 years, bus depot stations, anything polluting people's first response was, put it uptown, right? Don't keep it downtown, just put it uptown. And over time, through, a, to, through this planning process, we now look at different communities and find that children have the highest rate of asthma, diabetes issues, and a lot of it can be linked to poor planning in some of our poorest neighborhoods because they didn't have the ability to bring lawsuits or because new immigrants were arriving, they didn't fully understand the political process as they do today. And so we have to deal with that. So the question is, how do we create housing, both luxury, affordable, but you're right, how do we deal with industry? And so what the planning process has to be about is looking at the new economy of New York. And I think one of the great 
opportunities for employment on the ground level is to look at how we can create healthy neighborhoods and create a new economy. And that has to do with food supply and production. How we look at an urban, um, an urban agriculture program in the city that eventually will create jobs, create healthy produce that can lift up our communities. And that is not just pie in the sky, in, you know, environmental <coughs> hope. That should be incorporated in the planning process. So if a million people live in what's called food deserts, not food desserts, food deserts, where people can't get the produce they need for a long life and healthy, and healthy families, we can zone and plan for that to happen. That will create jobs, that will reduce hospital costs, and that kind of collaboration has to happen. We have a $1 billion food procurement operation, yet we have no agency in the city that deals with food and markets. Crazy. Crazy. Lagging behind other big cities. We can create the opportunity for that kind of job development. So again, when you think about, well, how do we achieve this? It really has to do with starting on the most local level, looking at the impact on the environment in certain communities, where the zip code where you live determines your longevity, and then take that and say, okay, how do we plan for this? And I think that is something that can create local <coughs> communities uh, and create a new economy through land use and zoning. Richard, the borough president talks about environmental hopes uh, in the planning uh, environment as it stands now. There is a there is a document that is meant to deal with both environmental hopes and fears, the environmental review process and the EIS. Um, that and uh, a kind of parallel process of community benefit agreements are two sort of non ULERP um, mechanisms that have developed over time to deal with some of the concerns of the community. Do you think they've been effective? Do they work well with ULERP? Well, two things. One is the EIS is actually part of the whole ULERP process. And so basically that process of the EIS helps identify potential negative um, impacts from a, a, a zoning action or a new development. And it tries to find ways to mitigate those um, those potential problems. So I think that's a helpful process. Um, these community benefits agreements have not been part of the ULER process. And, you know, there's a very good reason why they aren't, um, one of which has to do with some constitutional issues regarding um, not ha having exactions for development, not being directly tied to uh, the impacts of a project because community benefits agreements sometimes deal with issues that have little direct nexus to the development but reflect community needs. And that's fine, but that's a process that's outside of the formal EULAR process. Um, one of the things that I want to also mention is regarding community hopes and so forth. A lot of the rezonings have been developed from conversations with communities and have been developed at the behest of local communities, community boards, and civic organizations. Um, oftentimes people will find in their neighborhoods new developments that they don't like based upon the 1961 zoning. And they have come to the department and said, this is a problem. And sometimes they said, we'd like to do a 197A, which is a long involved process as we all know, but sometimes the issue can be resolved by a simple rezoning. And so a lot of the 113 rezonings that the city has done have stemmed from, a great majority actually, have stemmed from local communities saying, we want to protect the character of our neighborhood. We don't want these big buildings going up in our single family homes, neighborhoods. And if the department and the community and the administration has been responsive to that. Paul, I think you've been on the, <laughs> on the front end of some of those yeah. requests. What do you think about uh, you know, whether, how much that's part of the picture and what the right. response has been from the city? Well, I, I, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I think on the one hand, uh, Mr. Eady is absolutely correct. On the other hand... You can stop there now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, I, and I, I, I bring this up because uh, much of this, in, in my experience, uh, particularly in the last decade, has been based on proximity to Manhattan and waterfront. Um, the further away you are from Manhattan 
and or uh, high density waterfront potential, the better chance you have of getting what you want. Um, I have been involved in approximately one quarter of those rezonings in the city of New York in the last eight years. And most of them have been low density rezonings. Um, and what I can say is, uh, and going back to Bar President's point of a planner being hired by every community board, um, I, I have been that planner on the planner that gets hired by the community board, the city council person, the assembly person, et cetera, uh, because there is this incredible dearth of professional experience, even with community board members in some cases who've been on community boards for decades. Um, a lot of this stuff is complicated, there's no question about it. And a lot of the people who are, you know, one of the things I say to folks often, because I also work with civic associations, homeowners associations, is that the, the city's agenda is not necessarily the people's agenda. And this is something that, that Julia brought up uh, prior. Um, uh, my goal is to try to make those neighborhoods' agendas the city's agenda. And I have been lucky that, uh, particularly in the lower density areas, there, there was a change of heart. And I can tell you exactly when it was. It was uh, May of 2003. And what happened was, uh, and this is all inherently political, and let, let's not fool anybody about any of this. I, I, again, laud the bar president for his apolitical uh, uh, attempt at placing community board members that are not political appointees. Uh, this is not how it works in Queens. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work that way in the rest of the city. Um, and <clears throat> between that and the home rule aspect of the city council where a project will either go forward or not go forward based on the opinion of that council person. End of story, um, with few exceptions. Uh, it was important at this moment in time in 2003 because particularly with, with lower density neighborhoods uh, where things hadn't really happened very much until the mid 90s and late 90s. And then all of a sudden there was an explosion of development due to the mismatch, as we describe it, of the map from 1961 with the physical environment of the city, which is because that map was designed for a build out, as they call it, in 2000 for 12 to 16 million people. And we went from having 8 million to 7 million to a all time high of 8.3 million or 8.4 million or whatever that number is now. It's not very much more than it was in 1961, but it, it, it re chaos throughout the lower density areas of the city, which were zoned for much higher density, even though the areas looked a certain way. Now, now but uh, just, so just yeah. to stay on downzonings for a second, yeah. because I want to bring Julie in. Uh, absolutely. Downzoning is a great, everyone loves them, but they raise a math problem, which is that the city is apparently going to grow. And if we downzone two thirds of Staten Island, um, then you know, where are the new folks going to go? The city has to grow, it's going to grow. Julia, what do you think about the down zonings, and do you feel like they have followed a kind of a rational approach to where to put new people and where not to put new people, or have we, have we gone down zoning crazy in the city? Um, well, I'm a great fan of, the, of city planning. Um, however, I don't think there's very much rational about the process. Um, and in part, that's because of how extraordinarily difficult it is um, to do what city planning is supposed to do. Um, Paul mentioned the uh, 1961 zoning resolution, which, you know, that was something drawn up by um, planners and civic leaders who were really intellectual children of the New Deal. And they believed in sort of the infinite progress of mankind and the infinite growth of New York City and they wrote a zoning resolution for a city that was never going to be, and um, a city far larger than um, we're going to get or we would want. And as Paul rightly says, the ramifications of that for many neighborhoods, for low density neighborhoods, was really an irrational um, uh, impulse towards overdevelopment of those neighborhoods. Now that said, one of the very unfortunate realities of life is that um, an awful lot of people want to live in the neighborhoods that Paul is trying to protect. And at least some of those neighborhoods 
do have to be developed more intensely so that New York can attract um, the residents and businesses that it wants. And Scott said, I, I noted this because um, I, I think this is so extraordinarily true, and I think everybody in the room probably agrees with this, but everybody in the room will not agree with what we have to do to get this. And, and Scott had said um, he thinks it's very important that we create communities where the entrance fee is not a $2 million co-op. Okay, there is a fundamental economic conflict between that statement, which we all agree with, and Paul's efforts to protect neighborhoods in Queens. And that really is a fundamental conflict. Do you see that conflict, Paul? Uh, um, not particularly, because, again, we're, we're starting from a, a start moment where the area, the whole city was zoned for a, a number, as, as we just said, that was never going to happen. And so... One thing that has to be understood is that every one of these plans allows for growth. Every single one of these down zonings allows for growth. So this was not something that uh, came in and froze the neighborhood in time. Um, what this did was uh, essentially create a map that better reflected what the community looks like today because it hadn't changed very much in 45 years since the previous iteration. But areas absolutely were allowed for growth. And, and to, to, to add to that, not only was there tremendous consultation with the communities in question, one must remember that almost all of these neighborhoods are very far from public transportation. The seven train ends at Main Street. Northeast Queens goes for another eight miles until you get to Nassau County. These are places that are not serviced terribly well by bus, you do have the Long Island Railroad, and that's where we put growth corridors, was along the railroad stations, which makes sense. So, you know, this is not about not creating opportunities for development. It's, it's, it's something that I say to a lot of people, we are animals, just like the dogs and the birds and the raccoons. We can deal with gradual change pretty well, but it's much more difficult to deal with jarring change, such as a 14-story building across the street here where there might have been a two-story building prior. So, here's, some, here's some jarring change. I want yes. to have Richard wants to talk and Absolutely. then the borough president. Yeah, no, I just wanted to agree with um, what Paul is saying in that a lot of the rezonings were in one, two-family neighborhoods that had seen the growth of large buildings where they hadn't existed. But there's been also a lot of, a lot of discussion about comprehensive planning. And New York City is a complicated city and a lot of different neighborhoods with a lot of different needs. And, you know, to the degree that you think you know a neighborhood today, three years from now, it's changing. And so the way I think the chair burden, the commission, and the department looks at this is we try to have a comprehensive plan in that growth happens in areas where there is transportation. Um, we try to protect the character of intact neighborhoods. Um, so we don't want the, car, the city to become overly car dependent. Um, we have a vision that, and we've upgraded uh, neighborhoods where are rich in transportation. Parts of downtown Brooklyn, parts of the west side of Manhattan, parts of uptown Manhattan, where there's been either disinvestment or lack of development, trying to encourage further development in areas where they have the transportation to move people in and out of neighborhoods. And so I think all these things taken together helps create a city that allows for some growth, but also protects the character of a lot of intact neighborhoods that people want to live in. Mr. Uh, I think Paul um, raised an interesting question about transportation and local communities beyond Manhattan. And I, I just want to point out that this administration missed a strategic opportunity to deal with the fact that maybe a million more people are going to come here, move into communities where in order to get to the business district, it would require taking two buses and a subway to come into Manhattan. And when the issue of congestion pricing uh, popped up in the mayor's very well thought out uh, sustainability plan, 
it was from the Manhattan perspective. So the strategy was to engage Manhattan, speak to our, editori our thoughtful editorial boards, but there wasn't a strategic plan for the other four boroughs who, who felt rightfully so that how can you plan for transportation from the lens of Manhattan without understanding you had to develop a five borough transportation plan. When I became borough president, we had a very thoughtful conference at Columbia University called Manhattan on the Move. And we talked about a transportation plan for the borough. And in retrospect, the plan, w the plan that we devised, which a lot, a lot of it was, has now been talked about and implemented, was, was not enough because we had to partner with the other five boroughs. So in December and November, I'm, ha I'm conducting, I'm having a five borough transportation conference, which is going to look at how you pay for transportation and drill down about how we bring Staten Island, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens into the discussion. So Manhattan, my constituents, are going to meet, maybe clash, probably learn that there's a big city out there where people can't move without a new transportation plan, and that gets to the short-sightedness of a city administration that is just Manhattan-focused. So, and you know, I don't like to criticize the mayor in any way, um, <laughs> but what we have to start thinking about strategically is how we actually go out into communities and give them the tools they need. And I want to make a pitch for something. In the city budget, when you're reading about the mayor pegs, 2%, 4%, the community boards have not had an increase in their budget in 19 years. 19 years. If you believe money doubles every 7 or 10 years, think about the ramification when we talk about planning. Julia, who sometimes has a different perspective than some people on the panel, comes to this meeting today and talks about her passion for community boards. Everybody agrees that we need to have that conversation, yet the mayor is choking the ability of communities to have a discussion. Cutting the borough president's budgets, whether you like borough presidents or not, and we agree that they play an important role in planning, no borough president going forward after 2013 is going to be able to build, build a land use infrastructure than I was able to do six years from now because the money won't be there. The Public Advocate's Office, which could play such an important role in bringing these voices to the table, has a budget that is useless. And so we've concentrated power in Manhattan at City Hall, but we haven't used the resources to engage people. What a terrible mistake when if we could engage everybody in the city on land use and development, we could help transform all of these communities. So when Paul goes out and does his good work, imagine giving him the tools on a community level where City Hall is actually cooperating. I think it's a tragic misopportunity, and it does not engage the planners of tomorrow in places beyond the borough of Manhattan. And I think it's a terrible waste. David, I think that uh, neighborhoods that we're all referencing kind of are, they describe a profile of your own. It's on the neighborhood, it's on the waterfront, it's not particularly well served, at least parts of it, not particularly well served by, by mass transit, um, and it's low income, which, which creates, you know, new, different challenges. What do you think your neighborhood needs in terms of density, more or less, industry, more or less, and you mentioned before wanting to talk about 197A plans. I guess that's where that sort of thing might be discussed, and what's your experience with it? Sure, sure. So I, I don't think we could talk about um, sustainable communities without having a real discussion about how, you know, public subsidy feeds into that for longer terms of affordability, right, and deeper terms of affordability. If we look at our neighborhoods and the transient nature of some of the communities that have changed over the, the recent years, we're talking about low-income communities where part of the planning process has always been how do we maintain and keep the folks who currently live there in the character of those neighborhoods. Well, city programs, state programs need to dovetail with that you know, in a far better way, right? When we're talking about 20-year terms of affordability, 30-year terms of affordability, those things expire, right? Those things allow for developers to capture subsidized housing, come into our neighborhoods, 
hold off and then change in 20, 30 years. And we've seen this across the city. Um, neighborhoods change through the use of affordable housing programs. And I think what my community needs, right, we just went through a major rezoning where the signature group, uh, former city council member, speaker, uh, Gifford Miller, uh, actually went through 11 block rezoning, 2,200 units in our neighborhood. Um, tapped into a lot of the city programs, but 15, 20 years from now, what are the incentives that he has in the back end to get back into these programs? And, you know, this is an ongoing fight for our neighborhoods, right? Our neighborhoods are constantly under attack because of not always over speculation, but just right above different thresholds, right? And, and there's a whole mask of people who like use and hover around programs for some time and then come back and use them to change our neighborhood. So I think our neighborhoods need, my neighborhood definitely in the South Bronx needs, you know, longer terms of affordability in city programs, deeper levels of affordability in our neighborhoods. And I think that could hold on to some of the character um, and sustainability issues that we have in our neighborhood. Well, I think it's uh, actually a great segue to talk about 15 or 20 years down the road, because we're going to get to that, but we'll have to do it without the borough president, who's going to leave, and Brian Cook is going to replace him. Now you you've got the man with the knowledge. <laughs> I want to just, just, can I just thank everybody for being here, and don't be disillusioned that the fact that it's one of the most beautiful fall days outside. Uh, <laughs> you're here in lockdown learning and <laughs> participating. I will enjoy the rest of the day. No, just kidding. But I, I, I just want to say I'm just honored to be on such a distinguished panel, and I think this is a great credit to the new school. I hope to see all of you soon. Brian, thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, so we've talked about um, the process as it exists now and whether it does or doesn't work. We've talked about some of the substance that that process has produced in recent years in terms of down zonings. Um, let's talk about the future, the 15, 20, the 50 years down the road, and this question of whether New York needs to plan comprehensively, what that would look like, whether it would work, how we would do it. Um, Paul, you have you know, talked about the outer borough areas where, where you have operated. The plans that you have worked on, do you think that they will hold up in 10 or 20 years? Do you think that, that they are well integrated into the transit and the school site and the other comprehensive issues the borough president uh, talked about? Well, I hope so. Um, but, but I'll also say that uh, uh, the, you know, one, of, one of the biggest problems that the city has always had um, is a let's develop first and worry about infrastructure later. This has been the longstanding uh, status quo of, of uh, operation by not just this administration, but previous administrations as well. So <clears throat> again, I've worked not just in Queens, I've worked in Brooklyn and Manhattan and four other states. And you know, th th these are issues that are quite um, similar everywhere I am, whether it's a, a, a lower income neighborhood, whether it's urban or suburban or a high income neighborhood or near the water, et cetera. I, it's all the same issues when you get down to nuts and bolts. And <clears throat> one of the things I could say is that it took in many cases 40 to 30 to 40 to 50 years for these neighborhoods to be rezoned. Um, I can only think of one case off the top of my head where a neighborhood was rezoned and then quickly rezoned after that. Um, and that was Corona actually, and uh, North Corona had been rezoned for growth. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know where Corona is, it's on the west side of Flushing Meadows between Jackson Heights and uh, Flushing Meadows Park. Um, it's a low to moderate income neighborhood, and uh, it had been rezoned for a very high density. Um, and within about four years, it was rezoned for lower density because city planning actually went, whoa, I think we overstepped this because the neighborhood can't absorb it because the schools are at 250%. And all the other issues that go along with that, sanitation, uh, uh, overburdening, uh, housing stock, et cetera. This is an issue throughout the city. Uh, we have a school out in uh, Far Eastern uh, Fresh Meadows called Francis Lewis High School. It's been in the papers recently because the school was built for about 2,000 or 2,200 kids, and there are over 4,000 kids in this school right now. Uh, and this is typical of schools, not just in Queens, but throughout other parts of the city. How can we 
uh, honestly have a discussion about new development opportunities when we're not taking care of the infrastructure that we need. And again, this cuts across every community. Brian. You know, I'm actually curious. Have, how many people in this room have ever read the 10-year capital plan for the city of New York? So, I mean, I want you to think about this. There's a plan out there that is supposed to plan out 10 years of capital improvements that we're going to need. If you ever read it, it's the most amazingly bureaucratic, useless <laughs> document. I mean, it tells you how much they think it's going to cost, maybe how many facilities, and if you're lucky, an agency might identify a general neighborhood. The, what we're not doing in any way is taking a look and saying, where, first, what are the places, the types of places we need to grow? What, what are the types of criteria that we should have so that people could objectively and communities can objectively do it? But then the other thing we're not even doing is we're not saying, here are the neighborhoods that are essentially needing <coughs> basic services and basic growth. And here it is in a simple, easy to read format, the basic maps that we have. And then communities can look at it and go, you know, I didn't know I needed a sanitation garage. And I might not <laughs> want a sanitation garage, but I can actually see it and I can get it and I, maybe I actually needed work on this for my community. Instead, what we do is we wait until the Department of Sanitation comes up and goes, <coughs> in a year, I'm going to put a sanitation garage two blocks from your home. So what do you think that conversation's like all of a sudden? It's not macro. It's not even neighborhood. It's not borough. It's a two-block conversation, maybe a four-block conversation. Failing to comprehensive plan is going to make us less competitive. We won't be able to support ourselves. I think it's uh, interesting that one attempt at a long-range um, strategy, Plan YC, has not been mentioned to this point until I just did it. Uh, it's, I think it's also interesting that we've been talking for an hour and a half about planning and no one has mentioned Robert no Moses or Jane Jacobs. I think that's got to be a record. So we should all be very proud of ourselves for that. Um, but, you know, long-range planning raises the issue that I think Richard talked about earlier. This is a, a massive and dynamic city, and the question is, would a comprehensive plan that we produced be obsolete by the time you know, it, was, it was ready to be read? And so I guess the question is a process one. What kind of a, what, the, the system that we have now, do we start from that and improve it? Do we destroy it and start anew? And how do we do something that's gonna be effective in long range planning, but also flexible enough to deal with the fact that it's a, it's a changing city? I don't know who wants to, Paul, you wanna weigh in on that? Well, uh, you know, this gets back to the 197A process. You know, this is, this is supposed to be neighborhood planning, it's supposed to be a comprehensive plan in some cases for a particular neighborhood. And as the bar president said, and I, I know his planning person will say, 99% of these things get thrown on a shelf. Um, I, I will give a, a quick example, which is actually listed in this fabulous book that all of you should pick up when you go out. Um, Williamsburg Greenpoint Rezoning. Williamsburg Greenpoint Rezoning happened uh, uh, in 2004, I believe. That's five, yeah, 2005? Last, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, but what most people don't know is that the community itself had spent 10 years on a 197A plan prior to that. And that plan was unbelievably detailed about what they wanted in their community. And <clears throat> that plan never happened. And the ultimate outcome of what happened in Greenpoint and Williamsburg was definitely not what the community wanted at all. And I know this because just before it all happened, I sat with 47 groups that were in an alliance sitting, trying to figure out how they were gonna stop this freight train from completely destroying their neighborhood. And they were unsuccessful, 100% unsuccessful. They got about 2% uh, of what they wanted at the very end because it was a mayoral election year. And again, this comes all back to politics. Whatever the intent of an agency is, that agency is ultimately answerable to one person. Uh, the council acts as a foil on occasion, but unfortunately in more cases it acts to facilitate. And when you have a bad plan and you have people who have aspirations for higher office and you have other people who are not working with the community and they all sit in a back room and decide a deal and then make an announcement, and that's exactly what happened. There's nothing that can be done because that's the way that the system operates. But everybody should know how that system operates so you make sure you don't get people like that to represent you. And that's exactly what happened in that case. And it's happened in other cases too, but that's one that I was involved in. 
So I can't speak about other processes in other areas. So, and in fact, the one person, just very, very quickly, the one person who was actually in a position to negotiate this was left out of the negotiations, and he was the zoning chair at the time, because, quote, he was perceived as too close to the community. So he was removed from his ability to negotiate for the community, and the land use chair ended up negotiating with two other council people, including Gifford Miller, uh, to, with the mayor's office, and the whole thing was wrapped up very neatly in about a week. May I comment yes, on Williamsburg? Um, I think, I mean, Williamsburg is just such a fascinating example to use. Um, and it actually is one of the neighborhoods that goes back to the $2 million co-op point. Um, in that, Williamsburg is on public transportation, and I'm sure we all agree that the city should be encouraging development, transit-oriented development on public transportation lines. Um, Williamsburg is a very desirable neighborhood on the water. Um, just from a development point of view, Williamsburg almost by definition is going to be under pressure of development because it's so desirable. Now, there have to be, for, for the good of New York City's economic future, there, and also in order to um, free up housing markets so that deep subsidies are not the only route to housing affordability in New York, there have to be some neighborhoods, some desirable neighborhoods that are developed substantially more intensively than they want to be. That's the, that's the heart of the controversy. In fact, Williamsburg, I would say, is the poster child for these issues. And that particular borough president's office is substantially less um, substantively engaged than is the Manhattan Borough President's Office. I think I think Marty would beg to differ. I, I know he would beg to differ, but what I mean is, he, when I say less substantively engaged, what I mean is these issues, the dilemma of which parts of Brooklyn are going to be developed and which are going to be protected in some way is not a public substantive discussion um, that the borough president engages in. Let's bring in, uh, we have to um, give the, uh, the audience a chance to weigh in, so let's have the last person to join our panel make the last point before we open it up. Okay. Uh, I don't want to talk just, you know, second guess the work of other rezoning specifically, but I'd like to bring up a point, and I think this speaks to the difficult situation we're in. If we had a comprehensive plan that, for instance, said we need a million people who are going to come in New York, or we need to get to a certain percent of vacancy of our apartment, our apartment rates, we could then take a look at each individual neighborhood, appropriately find quarters for growth, balance it with places for development, and pick and choose where it can go. And we can think about it in terms of where the growth needs to be, not in I need to put all the growth in a single neighborhood, but how can it be spread across the multitude of appropriate places. And while we attempt to do that on each individual rezoning right now, I think oftentimes what's missed is the larger picture getting sort of brought back to the community. You knew 9710 10th Street, we upzone Broadway uh, in exchange for getting affordable housing uh, subsidies. We will do so because we had a conversation with the community, not because they wanted height, but because they did want affordable housing, and they got that there was a transit, transit corridor. But what we weren't able to say is, and because you're taking 100 or 1,000 units of affordable housing, not 1,000, like 100 units, on this area, we have now 100 less units from this major goal we have to reach. And you know, when, same thing with East Side. There is no major goal to tally down. So I think too often we end up going to each individual neighborhood and saying, this one neighborhood is the entire city's preservation project or the entire city's growth project. And we need that larger thought, that larger perspective to put each individual zoning, each development plan into perspective. All right, let's get that larger perspective. Um, let me start over. <laughs> Provocative. 
Hi, I'm uh, very pleased to have observed this uh, outstanding panel and, and the contributions they've made. Uh, I do have a question, though, having just uh, been in, being involved in the very, its very early stages of a uh, uh, pilot project in participatory planning, which none of you have mentioned, which is, the, which is something that comes out of Brazil and has been done some work in Chicago and in Canada of local communities determining their own capital priorities in terms of the capital plans, in terms of city-created infrastructure, uh, right now on a very small scale. Uh, but I think which involves it, both the input and the account and the responsibility of local communities in making some of those decisions in terms of the capital priorities. And I'm wondering what role do you think, if any, that might have on a larger scale? Sure. Um, so to, to that point, um, what I would say is I really think there, there, there needs to continue to be a vital role with folks at, at the table, and there's, there's no questions um, about that. Um, what, I, what I really think in terms of communities building resiliency plans and developing their own foresight for what they want to see in, in, in the community is uh, dovetails with the importance of having uh, community-based organizations that are rooted in those neighborhoods as well. I mean, when you talk about planning processes like that, we're talking about intense resources over a period of time to be develop these comprehensive plans and do a lot of learning with community folks so that they're at a place to be able to do and feed into those, those, those um, those analyses. And, you know, I just wanted to make a point that I think, yes, there is a place, right? And the place continues to be in the not-for-profit world, right? I think it continues to be in the community development movement. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, some of the fights that we talked about along the, the Brooklyn waterfront or not, those, those were driven by community development corporations, for the most part, that were rooted in the community. So I, I think that th that's another caveat that needs to be part of that. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to um, ask questions here. I have something that's my, possibly on a more micro topic. It's regarding school overcrowding and the infrastructure question. Uh, I, live in the, I live in the West Village and we have a, a huge overcrowding issue here. We have large developments going up asking for rezoning easements. We have, we have existing developments changing uh, through conversions. And yet, there doesn't really seem to be a proper formula, an adequate formula, for this neighborhood in terms of determining the amount of school-aged children that will be coming in. There's an argument that if it's a luxury building, they'll go to private school. I tend to disagree with that. Um, maybe possibly some. But the CCOR formula right now, to my understanding, is based on a citywide average. And I would argue that if you look neighborhood to neighborhood, that formula varies very, very uh, significantly. So, you know, in terms of do we have a comprehensive plan or do we start acting on things that we can change now, I would like to suggest that maybe we look at that. Um, I, I have worked on the borough president's crowded out report, so I know this very intimately. Uh, here's what I actually find really interesting. Seeker predicts higher numbers of students coming into Manhattan than the DOE. The DOE uses projection models that assumes people are going to leave New York and people will stop having children. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the, it, 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 I, and actually our last crowded out report kind of looked at that. Um, what, what I would say is the problem is, I wouldn't even say seeker, it is the DOE. And the way the DOE is trying to use their planning process in some ways to meet their capital budget. They're stating how many seats they need based on how, many they, how much they budget they know they're going to get. Absolutely. It's one, one right. ingredient in a, in a whole, you know, in one pie. And so what, what we really believe is that you should actually, and what we just very simply did, took the information from the Department of Buildings. They know how many buildings are getting built. They know how many units are getting built. And we connected that to how many schools were getting built, and we reevaluated it. And I honestly can't fathom why this isn't easier to do, because uh, it'd be much better to go out to a community and say, we need to build a school here, but we don't have the budget for it, than to actually say, don't worry, in 20 years, you won't need a school. And in two years, you know, the wait lists are at 800 students. 
Jared. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. please. Oh, go ahead. Oh. You go first. Um, I actually wanted to bring in the point that Paul made, um, which I think just should be a fundamental principle, and that is the city should be building infrastructure, preferably before development, but certainly at a minimum along with development, and the current impulse is to bring in infrastructure after development, and it just doesn't happen. Um, and there are a few really obvious cases of this. The schools have won, horrifying case. And, um, but another is transportation in which uh, the very substantial rezoning of the Brooklyn waterfront, which is something I think was very important for the city and that development, I mean, those neighborhoods are um, fabulous and energetic and, and they are completely isolated. And I never understood why light rail was not discussed for the Brooklyn waterfront, similarly Hudson Yards. Yeah. Why not light rail? on the west side. Um, that whole west side development um, is going to be a very isolated development. So, I mean, it seems to me for the future, and I hope this is going to be a big issue in the mayoral campaign, infrastructure is our looming, serious, horrifying problem. Right. And, and on that note, sorry, one second. On that note, um, it gets back to the issue of the EISs. Um, the greater Jamaica rezoning, which happened I guess about three and a half years ago, something three years ago. Um, Jamaica is a huge uh, a downtown area in, in Queens, um, the largest actually. Um, and there was a huge rezoning that covered not just downtown Jamaica, but it went far beyond, above and beyond, um, uh, took in a huge area. And it was a major, major upzoning. Um, the build out for the upzoning was uh, estimated at about 100,000 people additional. 100,000 people. What I had a problem with was, again, this is an area that is very poorly served by infrastructure. Um, and the neighborhoods around it were very concerned, particularly the areas to the north, which are quite low density. But one of the things that was of concern was reading the EIS. And the EIS, which again, this is an EIS coming from the city. Uh, there is one company that does most of the EISs, or a good number of them. They're called AKRF. Take a look at them, okay? In the EIS, it stated that about 100,000 people would be coming. How many kids would there be? Oh, 3,000, okay. <laughs> there would be no effect on local schools. There would be no effect on the subway lines. By the way, the subway lines are the E and the F lines. Right now, people take the E line from three stops prior to the end to get on to go west to the city, because it ends in Jamaica. Serious problems. And these were all called out at the community boards. They were called out by myself, by the council people. It did lower the density on Hillside Avenue, which was the very north of the district that was being rezoned, from 14-story buildings to seven and eight-story buildings. So it did something in that case. But the amount for the entire district was uh, really not changed. And, and I have a real problem. Again, this comes back to infrastructure, as Julia said. If you're going to create density, if you're going to create density, you need to have infrastructure. And if your infrastructure is already overburdened, how are you going to deal with that? And I just want to just add to that. Um, and this is not to disagree with anything yeah. that any, any of the other other panelists have said, but, you know, one of the factors that we really haven't talked about is, you know, New York fortunately is a city that people want to come to. We're trying to create opportunities for them to live here, um, but we do have limited resources. And so with the infrastructure piece, you know, oftentimes it does follow development. And part of that is a factor that, you know, if we had unlimited wealth, we could build all the roads and infrastructure ahead of time and wait for the people to come. Um, unfortunately, that's not reality, and oftentimes we find situations of budget cuts and, and, and reduced revenues for the city. So I think, you know, there's a delicate balance here of trying to meet the needs of communities, but also trying to balance budgets and keep us on, you know, sound fiscal standing. And sometimes we get it right, and sometimes I, we probably don't, and we need to tweak things a little further. Uh, You've had your hand up for a while. Oh, thank you very much. Um, 
Well, going forward, going forward, Mr. Shuffler and everyone else, uh, and using uh, the Yankee Stadium uh, shopping plaza as an example, Gateway. Uh, what have we learned about the effect, input, relationships that community boards and neighborhood organizations can have in molding the outcome to the advantage of the people of that neighborhood? Great question. Um, and everyone knows the, the wealth that the Yankees have and the influence that they have. So with that said, there was a tremendous amount of community opposition to the Yankees plan, right? I mean, the Yankees plan not only included a new stadium, but it also included more housing, um, parkland, um, was all part of the mix that came out of the Yankee proposal. Um, the community is still waiting for a park that, that, that was, was taken away through the construction and a whole host of other community benefits um, that was sort of, one, um, not, not openly accepted. We talked about community benefits agreements earlier. Um, I know there was a huge push to get a CBA, um, part of the, the Yankees uh, rezoning. That hasn't happened. That didn't happen in the, in the Yankees rezoning, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then, so I think what, what, what we learned from all of what we saw at Yankees um, was that one, right, all the local politicians did vote in favor, right, of the Yankee Stadium plan um, with tremendous amount of support um, or opposition against the plan. Um, and I, I think uh, what we what we found, and, and someone who's a lo lifelong resident of, of the Bronx, is that um, you know the, the money and capital and the economics often uh, play a huge factor in what we're able to achieve and overcome, and the the, the relationship between money and voting and and all of those things play a, a critical part in our neighborhood. And I think it. You know, to Paul's point, until we start grooming and growing our own pipeline of people who come from our neighborhoods and live in our neighborhoods and um, and even maybe have stronger policy and provisions around campaign contributions and all that stuff, I think those are the kinds of things that we sort of need to really look at to create opportunities to have community be able to, to have more influence in the decision-making process. I will say that after the Yankee project, it became a lot easier to be a Red Sox fan living in the Bronx. <laughs> a lot less dangerous for me, but Richard, you wanted to jump yeah, in. Yeah, no, I, um, you know, that was an interesting project, obviously. Um, and I do agree that, you know, grooming additional planners and grooming community organizations to participate in the process, I think, generally speaking, most projects are improved through that type of input. You know, I, I've often said that you look at a lot of the major projects in New York City that have happened over the years, and you look at the original proposal and that which was ultimately approved, and that process of community involvement, the elected officials, and sometimes, you know, the fight that occurs leads to a better project at the end. So I think that's a good thing. Um, the Yankees, though, I, if I remember correctly, I think the community board approved it, if I remember correctly. It was, as you said, um, supported by the elected officials. And I believe there is a community benefits agreement. I don't know the current status mm -hmm. and so forth, but I believe one had been negotiated. It's uh, a CBA. There is a CBA, but right. I think it wasn't negotiated by the community groups, and I, therefore no. the CBA people say it's not a real CBA. It, 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 Something that, like that. That may be the case. Yeah. I, as I said, I'm not involved in that one. But um, there was a CBA negotiated, and I think the it Yankees fund. It was called fund. the CBA, I think, was the idea. <laughs> if it's called it, I call it that. <laughs> um, and I believe the Yankees funded it. What's happening with the organization and so forth, that I can't speak to. Next question. Let's see. Uh, I think, sorry, we'll go there, and then we'll go here. Actually, I didn't need to no, 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 that's fine. No, no, thank you. I, you know more about the history. So, uh, New York City is the only major U.S. city without, a, without an adopted comprehensive plan. And even Houston, which is, <laughs> is you know, known historically for being fervently and proudly opposed to any type of zoning, either, you know, either in, both in theory and in, prince, and in practice, has a comprehensive plan, an adopted comprehensive plan. And, um, you know, I was just sort of thinking about the 197A planning process, and the bar president had mentioned that, you know, oftentimes, you know, all of these resources are poured into the 197A only to have it sit on a shelf. 
Um, and I think, you know, one of the drawbacks to the 197A is that it focuses only on the district where, you know, and many of the issues that it addresses do not respect district boundaries, political boundaries, traffic, air quality, things of that nature. Um, so I'm just, you know, in most municipalities, what you have is a comprehensive plan that's adopted and then the zonings follow that. That's the way it's supposed to work. And here it's the zoning and we kind of hope that it's going to be in the interest of the larger community. Um, by the way, Plan YC, which was raised before, we know is not a comprehensive plan. It was not adopted by the city council. It's, you know, I, I think it sets forth many useful recommendations and it's very elegantly written, but it's white paper for the Bloomberg administration, essentially. So let's get some, let's get some uh, response to my, that. My question You're is for Brian, when uh, uh, Borough President Stringer becomes the next mayor, <laughs> will he, um, you know, will, will, will all of you, uh, you know, start gearing up to write and adopt a comprehensive plan? Uh, so uh, I will say uh, I'm not legally allowed to speak about uh, anything other than him as borough president. Um, but I cannot imagine not working in his administration on a, a comprehensive plan, whatever his administration is, and wherever he would go. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, one of the interesting things about comprehensive, you know, we touched on this earlier, about comprehensive plans. Um, you know, all the cities you mentioned, I think people prefer to live in New York. Um, you know, so if, 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 you know, if Houston has a plan and, you know, everyone were going to Houston, I'd say maybe they have something, but I don't see that happening. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, as I said earlier, New York is a complicated, you know, there are 52 community boards. It's, you know, some of the neighborhoods are suburban, some are business districts, some are manufacturing. You know, the time and effort to create a truly comprehensive plan um, and, you know, we have market forces, right? So we talked about infrastructure, and we talked about rezonings. And if people had built the infrastructure for 16 million people back in 61 saying, they're come, okay, well, let's do this, let's zone it, let's put the infrastructure in, let's wait for the people to come, they didn't come. So it's, that's just a way of saying that I think the process we have um, is one that gives us the flexibility we need to address market forces um, for development, when they occur, where they occur. Um, it responds to the needs of residents, neighborhoods, you know, who knew? I, I'm born and raised in New York. Um, the meat packing district is an area I remember when there was actually meat there. <laughs> um, the city changes so quickly and we need to be able to change with it. So I, in theory, I appreciate comprehensive planning in the broadest sense, but I think we need to have a process that's flexible and responsive and evolving to as New York evolves. Uh, right here. Jar Jared? Just, oh, just uh, okay. very, Perfectly, very quick. I want to get a couple more questions in. Yes, go very quick. Um, I've been lucky enough to work in New Jersey, which is one of the few states where master planning is law. So you do a master plan, it's adopted as law, and every seven years, there has to be a re-examination of that master plan. I, I don't see anything not flexible about that. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is also about process. And it's, uh, I'm going to aim it at you, David. Um, I, I, know, I know that you have been an, an active member of the South Bronx community for, what, 18 years? I mean, you were born there, but I'm talking about when you were an adult. Um, <laughs> the, one of the earliest statements made tonight, or the, this morning, was um, about the Melrose plan, that we see the, the stage to community organizers. And I don't know whether it was the intention, but I had the feeling that it was seed the stage, let them talk, and then we're going to do what we want to do. So the, the, the question I want to ask you, having to do with uh, your own experience, is how do you go from an advisory if, um, uh, to having... Real, uh, a real effect, and would you give, please, 
two examples of the work that you've done in the, the South Bronx area. One in which you really had an important project and nobody listened, and one in which you had an important project and somebody did listen. Great. I know Marty really well. I'm actually in his book, so <laughs> which everybody should get is um, uh, give me the tale of the Bronx. The Bronx River and environmental and social history. Bronx River environmental and social history. Uh, great new and a good read of the Bronx River. Um, so the, the the Melrose Plan. I think the Melrose Plan, when you look at that, is a is a example of um, uh, resiliency again. Uh, long-term uh, people who were conscious of a plan, who believed in a plan. Uh, My question is about your specific successes and failures. Successes and failures. Here we go. So uh, uh, a success of, of, of planning and resilience. I mean, we look at the two parks that I worked on um, as a teenager and into my adult career, um, which added uh, about 15 acres of waterfront park space. Uh, we're talking about a 13-year a, a fight. Um, in which, uh, you know, diff changing in politicians, um, finding ma manufactured ga gas plants underneath sites. Um, there were a whole host of different factors that I think um, have, has impacted our, our communities. And um, the success is those waterfront parks. Um, and uh, what we found to be able to get to that place is a, a ongoing persistence, an ongoing tenacious fight to be able to, to, to get those things, hold our local elected official, um, have community residents involved. Um, none of our fights that we've won in our communities have been an easy fight, right? Uh, I remember uh, early on in my career taking uh, uh, reporters down the river when there were 20 cars um, in, in the river and 15,000 tires um, and, and talking about, you know, at Concrete Plant Park, which is a 11.3-acre a park now um, at, in, at a former brownfield site, um, you know, and saying, look, you know, we, we, we see a beach here. We see a canoe launch here, and we see folks hanging out, and the reporter, you know, just, just will step back and say... I just don't see it, right? I just don't see it. And it's, it's the community's vision, I think, in, in terms of being always present and always pushing for our dream that has made, that, made a lot of our successes possible. Um, in, in terms of fighting, I mean, and, and some, some fights that we still have to continuously fight. Um, we look at Nyafco and Hunts Point, right, as an example of, uh, of uh, which is a, a waste transfer for, um, it's fertilizers and, and sludge that gets um, put in pellets and, and shipped around the world. Um, Nyafco was recently closed um, because of, again, a 10-year fight with uh, community residents pushing, pushing, pushing around air quality, um, odor issues. Um, and what, what Nyafco has done um, has you know, filed for bankruptcy, changed their name, and and put a change their suit as well, and came back. Right. So, in, in some ways, what uh, that is a, a success in terms of us winning and being able to close the facility. But it's an ongoing fight um, that 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 we have. I think so. I, I will use that as probably an example of maybe not not failure, but an ongoing fight and and how it resurfaces in many different ways. Well, this conversation obviously will continue into the Stringer administration uh, or certain whatever the future holds. Unfortunately, we can't continue it here. Um, I wanted to thank the, the panelists for their time and the New School for organizing it. And I just wanted to note, you know, just very quickly, one thing that, that I came to realize while doing the magazine is that, you know, when you walk through New York and you see all the beautiful vibrance and spontaneity of the city, the sidewalk musicians and the music blaring from bodegas and whatnot, that all of that plays out on a plan that was laid in some cases 200 years ago, and a subway system and a sewage system laid hundreds of years ago that makes it all possible. It may be very conscious of what the past has planned for us, and maybe think about you know, what our great-grandchildren will think about the plans we made. So as you're walking around today, uh, you know, watch out for traffic, look both ways, but think about the plans that made it all possible. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you.